are starting a new series entitled Hope. Hope. And um, <clears throat> at, the, at our last series of 2023, last Sunday, uh, New Year's Eve, it was just such a wonderful service. Uh, we had Andrea, Fred, and Sally who uh, prayed us out and into, out of 23 and into 24. And um, as we um, looked um, at what the Lord was doing, the Lord led me to share a verse which is found in Romans 12, 12. And it says this, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. And I said to you that I felt that the Lord had, was given us this verse for the start of this year, that, there, that the Lord wanted us to be anchored in this truth. And you know, it's rather interesting because um, when you read what Paul wrote in Romans 12, certainly in my translation, which is the ESV, the, the start of the, of the section is entitled Marks of the True Christian, which is rather interesting because that rather denotes that there are false Christians. You see, being a Christian isn't about uh, ritual and tradition. It isn't about inheriting it from your parents. It's about a living, breathing relationship with Jesus and the outworking of that in your daily lives. And you know, he says here, Paul, I'm gonna back up to verse nine. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. And then he says this, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. These are the marks of what it means to have a living relationship with Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I believe that for many, we are in a season where we need, boy, do we need a lot of hope. I mean, with my daily intake of news, I move very quickly into hopelessness. When I see where the world is heading, when I see the increasing conflicts, when I see the darkness that pervades society, it is very easy to fall into hopelessness. But as we've been singing, Jesus is here to give us hope. And so over the next number of weeks, as Freya said, leading up to Easter Sunday, a great celebration of our hope that Jesus is gonna come again because he rose. We're gonna have some wonderful speakers join me as we unpack what the Christian hope is. What the Christian hope is. And my, my prayer is, is that you and myself will see a, a marked shift in how we see ourselves and as we see the world around us. And so my job this morning is to uh, lay a foundation, if you will, for this rest of the series. And I'm gonna be looking at the why and the what of hope. Why is hope important? And what is the Christian hope that we speak of? I was, I was here at a talk recently and the person quoted um, a gentleman called Hal Lindsay. Now, some of you may recall his name from a very uh, famous book that he wrote in the 80s called, called the, Lo uh, the Late Great Planet Earth. Uh, some of you may know him. And he said this about hope. Man can live about 40 days without food, about three days without water, about eight minutes without air, but only for one second without hope. I like that. Now, it's, it's, it's probably not technically accurate. Everything else before is, but the hope bit. But you might say, hey, Mark, I've been living out without hope for a year and I'm still here. I hear you. But I think it rather makes the point quite starkly that just as we need air and we need food and we need water, in order for us to live our lives, we need hope. And I think he does a good job of of saying that. And as I, was, as I was researching and studying for this series, I came across this fantastic article in the Christian Chronicle, and it's entitled, Hope, the Greatest Story of All Time. And this was written in October 2007, and I want to read some extracts from this because they do a much better job of me doing so. So let me read this. 
It says this. <clears throat> Hope itself is the biggest story of all time. And yet the creator of the world already has written the ultimate account. Suffice it to say that a sufficient headline size does not exist to declare the enormity of the Son of God dying on a cross to save us from our sins. Hope cannot be counted, defined, or photographed. You can't buy it, yet nobody lives well without it. It's close to the core of what it means to be a Christian and a key component of the church community. Many struggle to define it, but it may be one of the Bible's easiest doctrines to identify. Enduring hope pervades biblical teaching from the rainbow over Noah to all of us under the reign of Christ, from the promised land to the promise of heaven, from offering up a sacrifice in the tabernacle to offering up praise in church. Hope is the core thread and the common bond. Hope is absolutely critical, entirely indispensable, centrally biblical, and eternally available. Hope is remarkably relevant to both the modern and postmodern, to people of every race, the Christians of all generations. Isn't that a good summary? Maybe as I'm speaking those words, that's resonating with you. Maybe in this moment, there's something in you that's saying, oh, man, I, I've been living in a season I feel like without any hope. I, I, I feel desperate for this, Mark. I want this type of hope. I want a type of hope that I can rejoice in. Do I get an amen in the house? Yeah. I want to rejoice in hope. I tell you something, this talk comes, this series comes at a good time for me in my life. You know, Steph and I and the family, uh, many of you know Steph's uh, sister, Sam, her son, who's eight years old, Luke, has um, been suffering with a brain tumor in a battle for two years now. He has a, the first one, praise God, disappeared. The second one came back. And, and now he's, uh, the doctors say, end of life. And in, in, in all respects, he's in a vegetative state. But we are holding on with hope that God is working behind the scenes. And so I share this not as some academic theological exercise. I share it with you as something that I and Steph and the family are holding on to and making a decision to rejoice. Because who knows, life ain't easy. You know, Adam and Eve didn't need hope before they ate the apple. And when we see Christ again, we will not need hope. Boy, we need hope now. And you see, God hasn't left us on our own. Now, it's kind of interesting because as I continued on my research and my study of this subject, as I look to lay out a foundation for the next few weeks, I found it interesting to discover that science is discovering that physically we need hope. I'd like to quote to you from a paper from Trinity College Dublin. It says this, we know that hope works for the brain and in the brain. If you experience hope in the face of adversity, your brain performs better. And you are more likely to make positive positive decisions regarding your health, such as adhering to medication and adopting a healthier lifestyle in the face of chronic diseases. Experiencing hope dampers the anxiety circuits in the brain. And when you feel less anxious, your brain function improves. Hmm. Harvard Health, lest you think I haven't done enough study. (laughs) But hope is also beginning to reveal its value, this was written in 2021, in scientific studies. Among young adults with chronic illnesses, greater degrees of hope are associated with improved coping, well-being, and engagement in healthy behaviors. It also protects against depression and suicide. 
Among teens, hope is linked with health, quality of life, self-esteem, and a sense of purpose. It is an essential factor for developing both maturity and resilience. Now, you've heard me use this phrase before, but I will use it again. I love it when science catches up with the Bible. Because we only have to read in Proverbs 13, verse 12, to see what the scientists are discovering. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But the desire fulfilled is a tree of life. All that science eventually does is discovers the truth of this. I was speaking to a brother only this morning and he quoted this exact verse. I said, brother, I'm preaching on that this morning. And he himself was in a position where he was holding on to hope. Now, what does it mean, hope deferred makes the heart sick? Well, deferred, we know what deferred means. It means to put off, to drag out. You know, Steph and I last night started watching um, a new series on Paramount Plus called The Castaways. Anyone seen that? No one's seen that. Well, it's very good. It's got Sheridan Smith Smith in it. Right, blank face, faces. (laughs) Of Gavin and Stacey fame, although that was only a small part. She's done some, she's a fantastic actress. Anyway, there is a point to this story. We started watching, and to be honest with you, almost finished watching. We're not prone to binge watching, but it was that good. But I don't want to spoil it for you, but it's in the title. They are cast away. And it was amazing to see that cast away and, and they start with hope. Right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get a fire, we're going to do this, someone will fight. And then you watch this progression from hope where the, the hope of being saved and rescued is deferred. And at one point, well, I don't want to spoil it for you, you'll have to watch it. But that was a visual representation of what happens when hope is deferred. Our heart becomes sick, and the heart here references not just your ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. It means the seat of your being. It means how your, your emotions and your soul, your spirit, there is an impact. And you see, God knows that that is the case in our fallen nature, in this fallen world. He knows that we need hope. We get to the good news in a minute, by the way. Hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. Oh, it printed on the other side. It doesn't normally do that. I was like, I'm missing a page. Here it is. (laughs) But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. You know, um, in Proverbs 13, 19, it says a longing fulfilled is sweet to the soul. Isn't there a sweetness when you're hoping for something? You're hoping and it happens. Boy, how do you feel? Oh, that's so good. I remember... Many years, well, I say many years ago, I want to say six or seven years ago, and we were, I founded a company in 2010, and we were looking to sell that, and we were going through a process, and I was hoping, Lord, we need, because at that point, you know, we needed to sell this company. And we had a potential buyer, and my hope was there, and all of a sudden, they pulled out on, like, literally the final hour. I mean, for those of you that know these things, we had agreed the heads of terms and all this kind of, and all of a sudden, and boy... Wow, I took a big dive. All of a sudden, that that hope that was imminent was deferred. But all of a sudden, there was another buyer that came and the hope grew. And then when it happened, boy, when we sold the company, it was sweet to the soul. And my prayer for each one of you guys this morning is that this year, your testimony will be, my longing was fulfilled and it was sweet to my soul. I'm going to pray on that point. Lord, that is our prayer as a people. That the testimony of this year would be that, as we join the writer of Proverbs to say, my longing fulfilled was sweetness to my soul. Lord, you know our hearts. You know those things that we are longing for, those promises that you've laid on our hearts, those hopes that we have in you. And I pray, Lord, that this would be a year of breakthrough and longing fulfilled. And I declare that and I decree that 
that I speak this over you, that this would be a year of victory in those areas that you are hoping for, that you would experience that longing that you have desired for so long. And I pray for those of you who can identify that hope deferred, I pray for healing of your heart and a restoration of hope as you wait for those desires to be fulfilled. The lies of the enemy that have been spoken over you that have said it's never going to be so, I break those lies off you in Jesus' name. And I speak the truth over you that you will rejoice in hope. That may, while you may have come in this place in sickness of heart, you will leave this place rejoicing in hope. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So what is the Christian hope then? Well, I'll tell you what it isn't. It isn't this. I hope I win the lottery. If you'd like to have a separate talk about whether you should play the lottery or not, then I'll schedule that for this evening. Hope is not, I hope it doesn't rain this afternoon because we've got a party. Hoping is not a wishful thought when we're talking about biblical hope. Let's look at Romans 8, 24, 25. It'll be on the screen, and if you're at home or on your device or wherever you are, it'll be on your device. For in hope, in hope, we have been saved, but hope is not, is, that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. I want to sum it up with this. A f- hope is a future, invisible, and confident expectation of the fulfillment of the promises of God. That's the best I can do as a summary. It's a little bit long. A future, invisible, and a confident expectation of the fulfillment of the promises of God. Why? Because our hope is in God is based on His promises. It isn't a wish upon a star, it's a hope upon the sun. I mean, wish upon a star, that's a phrase that we sing and we hear. Well, maybe you don't, but certainly children do. But it's a hope upon the sun. Why? Because he died on the cross so that we can walk in the promises of God. That's what's happened. And you can't disconnect the hope that we have in Christ from being saved by him. For in hope we have been saved. You see, you can't see the inner working of the Holy Spirit in you that regenerates you when you say yes to Christ. You can't see necessarily the inward work of sanctification. That means becoming more like Christ. But we hope in that work of Christ, of the Holy Spirit in us. That is what hope is, because his word says that that is what he will do. Hebrews 11.1, 1, as I continue to lay this foundation. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. It is also why one of the weapons of the enemy is to attack our hope. How does he do that? Well, what's the opposite of hope? Fear, despair, doubt, uncertainty, anxiety. These tactics are designed to remove you out of that place of hope in the promises of God. God has given you hope that you will have a new job. God has given you a a hope of restored rest relationship, God has given you hope of whatever it may be. And then all of a sudden the enemy says, but did God really say that? Maybe God says that for everyone else, but not for you. Surely, look how bad you've been. I mean, really? Is there really, you know, a God? I mean, really? I mean, does he really love you? I mean, Maybe there's a God, but he's just set this world in motion and he's left it to do what it wants to do. You see, these are lies of the enemy to pull you out of a place of rejoicing 
in hope. Essentially what it is, it is the, the lie of the enemy that says, did God really say that? Recognize that lie? Did God really say you can't eat of the tree? We've got to exercise our spiritual muscles. And it says in the scriptures that we are to hold every thought captive that is contrary to the word of God. And so when those thoughts come, he say, I'm not gonna, I don't accept that lie. I rebuke that lie in the name of Jesus. And then you get into the word and it says, God says, and then you list out his promises. This is how we are to live our lives as Christians. Not passive, but active. And I'm preaching to myself right now. I mean, just, hey, Mark, stop being so passive in your faith. Stop being so passive when the lies get into your head. You know, it says in the scriptures, Mark, that you're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. It says in the scriptures, Mark, that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It says in the word, Mark, that if you stand and resist the enemy, he'll flee. Wow, that's cool. So what I'm saying to us is this, is that we have to make a decision to rejoice in hope as we hold every thought captive that is contrary to the truth of God. That's what I'm saying. Now, I want to zone in on this point now is that the reason we can have hope in the promises of God is because of the promise keeper himself. We have our hope in God. And that's, I want to give you just three things about hope as I aim to um, end this talk. Three things about hope. True hope comes from God. Paul in Romans 15, in the, in the, in the next chapters as he writes, he says, may the God of hope. You see, hope has a name. His name is Jehovah. Hope is not a wishful thought. It is a God who loves us. And it says in the scriptures, God is not a man that should, he should lie. In Psalm 39, 7, the psalmist says this, and so, Lord, where do I put my hope? Maybe you're asking that question. Where do I put my hope then, Mark? Because I tried it in that, and I tried it in this, and it didn't work. I tried putting my hope in my bank balance. I tried putting my hope in, 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 in uh, my friendships. I tried putting hope in the, the natural giftings that I have. I tried putting my hope in this and the other, and it didn't work. So, Mark, where do I put my hope? The psalmist says this, my only hope is in you. My only hope is in you. Is your only hope in God? That is the question this morning. Is your hope in God this morning? Number two, hope is a gift. Can't earn it. You can't work for it. It's not based on how good you are or how bad you are. It is a free gift given by God through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, as when Paul was uh, writing in Romans 15, 13, it went on to say, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. See, as we trust in him, our hope comes so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so my prayer is, Lord God, I make a choice to rejoice in hope. I stand firm on your promises, but I am weak and I need your help. So Holy Spirit, would you come now and fill me with that hope? That's a prayer you can pray. When you feel battered and bruised and hopelessness, you just call upon the name of God and say, Lord, I can't manufacture this hope. I can't make it up. I can't change the way I feel. And so Holy Spirit, would you come now and fill me with that hope that you have promised, that revelation of God and his love for me as I make a decision to trust in him. That's a prayer for you. That's a prayer for myself. Because our hope is in a person. It is God, Jehovah. And number three, as I bring this plane into a land, hope endures. Proverbs 23, 18. There is surely a future hope for you and your hope will not be cut off. Biblical hope isn't because life, we can get our circumstances lined up and everything's rosy. Biblical hope is rooted in the truth that we are saved and that nothing can separate us from the love of God. You know, when I look at this world and I reference how I started this talk and, and I have my daily dose of news and my hopelessness levels start increasing, 
I just remember that I've read the end of the book and I know what happens. I know that Christ will be victorious. I know that I will spend eternity with him. I know that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ Jesus is Lord. I know that God will put all Christ's enemies under his feet. I know how it ends. That's the hope I have. The economic indicators, poor though they are, don't change the fact that my hope is in Jehovah Jireh, my God of provision. And as we live our lives and as we think about 2024 and as I end this talk, my question for you is this, is your hope in God? Is your hope in God? I'd like us all to stand as I pray.